Joe. Joe on Joe is the only podcast where Joe talks about Joe. And now, your host, Joe Slepsky. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Joe on Joe. It's me, your host, Joe Slepsky. And uh, we're here to talk about G.I. Joe issue number 98. That's right. It's an episode of Joe on Joe Illustrated. So welcome back to all my listeners and welcome to any new listeners out there. Hope you enjoy the ride. This is the podcast where I break down um, either an episode of the cartoon or more recently, every issue of G.I. Joe Real American Hero in painstaking detail, page by page, panel by panel. We look at uh, some of the storytelling techniques. We look at some of the history of the book and dig in, etc., etc., and so on and so forth. And today is G.I. Joe 98. Uh, I'm very excited about this. It's a slam bang of an issue. It really, really is. Um, I am uh, just broad strokes on it. Like it's like someone poured just someone hit the Nas button to put it in Fast and Furious parlance. Someone hit the Nas button on J. Joe in this issue, as if someone realized, "Holy cow! Issue 100 is is two issues away. Uh, we got to hit the Nas." Because this really is a rocket ship of an issue, and um, uh, and I'm excited. And I'm all for it. So, before we go further, let's hear from our sponsors, of the Movies in a Meal podcast. Listeners, I know what you need in your life. You need more podcasts, and you also love movies. So why not do a podcast that's about not, not one movie? It's about not two movies. It's about three movies and a meal. I'm talking the Movies and a Meal podcast. This show is great. It's brought to you by Keith, Brad, and Ben. And each week they bring a new movie to the table, which they all discuss as a group. And it's not, you know, your highfalutin movies. It's what we do in the shadows, the Fantastic Four, Rise of the Silver Surfer, and Out of Sight. You know, it's Bad Education, Ghost Rider, and A View to a Kill. It's X-Men Last Stand, Queen Sugar, The Mandalorian, and Major League Two. They are... A lot of fun to listen to. You guys know Ben. It's our friend Ben Penserga. He was a guest on Joe and Joe. In fact, Ben was the very first remote guest that I ever had on this podcast. So he's always got a special place in my heart. I'm really digging this. I, I just started listening to it last week. It is a lot of fun. They bring a guest in. The guest, uh, I, I listened to their Heather's episode. They, they were joined by Kelly. And she went in depth on her favorite movie, which was Heather's. And it made me want to go watch Heather's to watch with them. I really dig it. So, guys, find them out there at Movies and a Meal, Twitter, Instagram. Their website is moviesandameal.podbean.com. They put out one episode a week. Give them a listen, guys. Support them. Let them know Joe on Joe sent you. I don't think you're going to be disappointed. It is quite entertaining. And now back to the show. They always have something good to say over there. And now with uh, features being released back into the movies, it's a good time to be listening to the Movies and a Meal podcast. I, uh... I realized I've got that. There's a bunch of stuff I want to see. There's Halloween Kills coming out soon. Venom's this week. James Bond is right on the corner. Uh, and I don't know about you guys, but out here in LA, they've been uh, advertising the James Bond movie on these giant billboards. Um, and uh, it is possibly the worst billboard of for a film I've ever seen in my life. It's uh, three picture, three pictures of Daniel Craig. It's kind of like looking over his shoulder at you. He's facing backwards. And then he's kind of sort of looking at you. And uh, I think they're trying to emulate some high fashion billboards that I've also seen that actually have a, that have you know, a beautiful woman in a dress and she's doing some kind of thing. But however they stage this for the James Bond one, it is off-putting. It is tremendously off-putting. And I, 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 I'd say this now because cause I, I, made a, I made a mention of it. Uh, I think on Facebook or something. And uh, a buddy like two weeks later randomly comes up to me. He's like, remember that thing you said about the James Bond? He goes, I finally saw that billboard. I know what you're talking about. It's the worst I've ever seen. Um, Google it. It's shocking. It's, it's shockingly disturbing. Anyway, um, I can't wait for that movie. So there's a lot of really good movies out there. So it's a great time to be listening to the movies in a meal podcast. Uh, it's also a great time to be listening to you were saying, which is our segment that breaks down uh, movies and other comic books that were in the theaters the same month as the issue in question. So 
this was cover date of March 1990. And so it was actually released back in November 1989. And so let's take a look. We're going to jump in and take a look at the movies first, because since we're talking about movies. So um, on November 3rd, Bloodhounds of Broadway. It sounds, oh, Madonna's in this movie with Rutger Hauer. I vaguely remember this movie and absolutely have never seen it. Uh, the Phantom of the Opera. Now, this is a, it's a horror remake of The Phantom of the Opera. So emphasis on the horror. Oh, this is the one with Robert England. Oh, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. I would say this would be worth a revisit just because the Robert England stuff. Bill Nye's in this movie? That's fantastic. Um, but I, uh, I I can't say I can't say I've seen the second sight. This is with John Larroquette and Bronson Pinchot and Stuart Pankin. They did this on a pod or talked about this recently. I think this is a big stinker. Oh, and Stepfather 2. I actually did watch Stepfather 2 relatively recently <laughs> with Terry O'Quinn, uh, Meg Foster. Those two Stepfather movies are, are pretty great. They're insane. They're pretty great. Uh, also insane and pretty great in the um, uh, one-two punch sequel category uh, is Dentist and Dentist 2 with Corbin Burnson. Highly recommended for complete insanity. Uh, Kenneth Branagh's Henry V. I recall seeing this when I was in college and uh, really digging it. I have a feeling it doesn't hold up that much. It's probably a little uh, indulgent, but is this the one with... Um, Oh, wow, Christian Bale, Christian Bale was in this. Is this the one with Robin Williams? Robbie Coltrane's in it? I thought Robin Williams had a role in one of these. Anyway, uh, yeah, I do recall enjoying Henry V. Uh, on November 10th, Best of the Best, the martial arts movie. Boy, there's a, there's just not, I mean, November was not, I mean, My Left Foot, so that's Oscar bait. I mean, that one, a ton, Daniel Day-Lewis, that one ton of Oscars. Communion. That's that alien movie. Oh, wow. Uh, Christopher Walken. Polly on November 12th. This is a, oh, this is a Pollyanna made for TV movie. I thought that was, um, no, that's, a, that's a, thinking of the later years. The, um, the one was, uh, Jennifer Anderson was in a, something called Polly. Here we go. November 17th. Directed by Don Bluth. Here we go. Right in our throwing right in our wheelhouse. All dogs go to heaven. 1989 animated musical with none other than Burt Reynolds, Dom DeLuise, Vic Tabak, Charles Nelson Riley, Lonnie Anderson, Melba Moore, Ken Page, Judith Barcy. I mean, who isn't? This is. It's like they just. It's like they just recorded this on the set of a Cannibal Run sequel, and said, "Let's do this thing." Uh, for that, I celebrate All Dogs Go to Heaven. Also, Harlem Nights. Yeah, shoot your pinky toe off, Harlem Nights. Uh, directed by Eddie Murphy. I did try to watch this again recently. I remember uh, really wanting to see it a lot when I was a kid. And then finally seeing it and not being in love with it. I gave it a shot again recently. And I'm not in love with it. Uh, I think I think in the hands of a better director. No shade. Don't mean that in that way, Eddie. But I think in the hands of... And, ooh, he wrote it too. I think you would have had something here, but it just, it just never really clicked. Cause I mean, it's Eddie Murphy's in a Richard Pryor, Red Fox, Danny Aiello, Michael Lerner, Della Reese is great in it. Uh, Stan Shaw. Who else is in? Oh, Arsenio Hall, of course, shows up. Charlie Murphy, Robin Harris, Michael Buffer. Isn't that the, yeah, that's Michael Buffer. The, let's get ready to rumble guy. Desi Arnaz. Heinz the second is who is, is that like Desi Arnaz's? grandson or something interesting anyway um yeah harlem knights little mermaid oh that's huge okay so little mermaid little mermaid and all dogs go to heaven both debuted on november 17th what is happening what is going on why how why would they that seems crazy um obviously little mermaid is pretty great everyone knows it that's you know you don't have to wax poetic about that um mystery train wasn't this an Oh, no, this is uh, Jim Jarmusch. Miss. Oh, right. I saw this in film school, and I don't remember anything about it. But I do remember Mystery Train. Steel Magnolia. Oh, okay. So November 17th was pretty big, guys. We also got Steel Magnolias, which was huge. 
that was a that was a huge movie. I mean, there's to this day, the women of a certain age swear by that movie and reference it constantly. <clears throat> Toilet Teal, <clears throat> if you're listening. <clears throat> um, so now we scoot. I I think I know why. Yeah. So now this explains why November seventeenth was so packed with stuff. Because also the movie Prancer, that um, movie about the the reindeer, Prancer also came out on the seventeenth. But this actually makes a lot of sense because on November twenty second, Back to the Future Part Two. So I mean, you're not getting you're not getting anything else. So that is when Back to the Future Part Two is announced for that date. They blocked that week off, and then they actually blocked another week off because you don't get another big release until um, December 1st, which which is, two, what, two weeks? Yeah, right? Yeah, like two weeks or ten days later, um, which was National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation. So that that is exactly why all those movies were crammed in on the 17th because otherwise they would have had to wait until, you know, well into Christmas time. So if they wanted to get in before Thanksgiving, Back to the Future Part Two, and you're and you're you're, you're going to lose it. Back to the Future Part Two, probably one. All the theaters were booked for it, and then um, you're just you're not going to win against Back to the Future Part Two. So there you go. You were saying for what was in the movies. Now we're going to look at DC Comics. What was on the shelves? Uh, Adam Strange, number one. This is a, a three or four issue, three issue miniseries with the Kubert brothers doing uh adam strange this is fun it's a deluxe format so it's that that um not quite not quite graphic novel size but not it's like at the time they call it they actually refer to it as the dark knight format it's a thick square bound yet still soft cover format i'm pretty sure it's three issues um well, let's find out we'll get we'll click on it and then we'll go to issue uh, two and then we'll go to issue uh, a three yeah three issues uh richard bruning wrote it and andy kubert uh was the penciler and inker and adam did the coloring so that's cool and remember andy's been doing reason this stood out for me is andy's been doing the covers for the last few issues of gi joe today we get a change on that today we get lee weeks showing up on the cover of gi joe 98 which i'm a fan of uh lee weeks's art is really great and uh, uh i salute it It's also from DC, Adventures of Superman 464. I believe this is the first time Superman meets Lobo. Because he was introduced not terribly long ago in the pages of Omega Men. And when you look at his drawing, he's still drawn in that... um, Certainly, he's not wearing like the superhero tights per se, but he's still got pretty short hair and he's not overly muscled yet. I think this is Superman's first meeting with Lobo and that's exciting. Atlantis Chronicles number one. This was a Peter David written miniseries that um is is exactly what it sounds like is dr- beautifully drawn by esteban moroto they did collect this uh, a couple years ago in a trade paperback uh from dc it tells the origin of like atlanta so it's it's like there's aquaman's not even in the title of the book because it's really really is about atlantis and remember in the 80s dc was heavy on atlantis with um books like um Orion, and then obviously Aquaman. And I, I feel like Scar- Warlord played with it a little bit with Scartaris, but like or that book, Orion, w- literally took place in old Atlantis. So uh, they were big on like fleshing that out as this historical city that eventually become Aquaman's homeland. Very overlooked miniseries. It's really, really cool. It's been a good number of years since I read it. So I don't recall a ton of the plot points, but the artwork is gorgeous. And I remember really, really liking it. So, uh, really overlooked book. So check out Atlantis Chronicles if you're like a DC lore head, because it's really it's about like the lore and the historical stuff. Legion of Superheroes number five. Man, we could just keep doing Legion stuff every week because every week's a great issue. Legion number five is when they confront Glorith, and they find themselves in this world that's like not their world. And it's, it's with the removal of science and magic rules and they kind of have to, um, it's reset things. And this is the Legion team's way of addressing the Superboy stuff. And for the modern continuity of uh, having to replace Monel and what that does to the timeline, et cetera, and so on and so forth. So that's why you get a little, uh, little, what was, uh, time 
not globes. It was sand, like hourglasses. That's what it was. Uh, oh, Justice. So this is a good month, actually. Justice League 12, uh, Rex Mason, our pal Metamorpho, he meets his son for the first time. And his son was a mutant. If you recall, uh, Rex is the uh, is Metamorpho, the element man. And he they gave him a son with um, Simon Stegg's daughter. Mm, blanking on her name. But they revealed why she kind of left Rex and kind of was ignoring him, you know, cause she, he, he had a little amnesia and then she was giving him the cold shoulder. And it's because, uh, Simon Stegg took their kid and was using their kid as basically a source for fuel for his uh, company. And, uh, it's not good. Cause while Rex could metamorphize himself, the kid metamorphizes other things. So his grandfather, Simon Stegg was using the kid to make all this like they, like you know like a nuclear fuel or stuff for his company it's 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 really quite sad and really cool and i love seeing metamorpho drawn by bart sears that's what i really enjoy i'm here for that um let's see star trek star man superman time masters continues time masters is a eight issue miniseries dan jurgens um and it's uh a rip hunter so, uh, Rip Hunter, the time, the time master, this is about a team of time travelers. This would eventually become the, what do they call them? The time to keep, well, it's the, the group that hang hung out with, um, from Armageddon 2001, uh, wave rider. So do are they, are they, do they continue to call themselves the time masters? I think they do. Maybe they do. But that group of people who are at the end of the earth, this is kind of the origins of them, of DC's telling that story and figuring out that there's this, you know, omniscient group of, of, you know, timekeepers that are keeping the, um, you know, keeping watch over the, over the time stream, which eventually booster gold would become a part of. And I believe canonically booster gold is rip hunters father. Um, because they never revealed who they always said rip hunter wasn't his real name. Cause if you ever knew his real name, you could go back in time and kill him. Uh, and then, uh, and then the booster thing in the booster series, they alluded that, yeah, booster is actually his dad which is kind of neat. So that's it. There's a whole bunch of, so this is a good month for DC. It's a whole bunch of like continuity, like deep ins and outs of DC stuff. Speaking of Lobo, he's also in Miracle Man 13. He's having a month. You were saying. Now we're going to check out Marvel comics. Let's see what was happening here. Spider-Man, Eric Larson, Spider-Man, Amazing Spider-Man 350, three, I'm sorry, 330. Spider-Man meets the Punisher. Is a cover I've seen used a lot. Um, it's not my favorite rendition of either character, but because it's got Pun- Punisher and Spider-Man on it, you, you end up seeing this referenced a lot. Um, Avengers West Coast 56, Scarlet Witch is going mad. It's one of those representational covers where it's like a giant Scarlet Witch holding the holding the team. It's, uh, was it Simon Williams and Hank Pym and looks like Wasp and like, you know, like in the clutches of her hands as they dangle, you know, at her mercy kind of a thing. Classic X-Men 45, this reprinted the Wolverine, Nightcrawler, Go to Canada and Meet Wendigo again story, which is one of my first X-Men stories I ever read. My cousin Mike let me loan those. And I want to say it's X-Men 140, let's see, 138, 7 killed, 38 killed, 39 and 40. So this would be 139, because I think, was it 141 or 142 is Days of Future Past. So I think this is 139 and 140. So that, that is all off the top of my head. Everybody thinking out loud as we speak. Let's go into it. Classic X-Men 49 reprints X-Men number 139. There it is. That makes sense. Um, what a great, really, 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 really great adventure. Uh, and I didn't even realize that, like at the time, I hadn't read you know Hulk 181. So I didn't realize that how the Wendigo was connected to Wolverine's origin and all that stuff. Um, but they go up North and they meet alpha flight and snowbird and she goes, becomes a, a, a Wolverine and Wolverine has to calm her down, but it's great. The reason that story is actually really great because it's a wonderful friendship thing with nightcrawler and it deals with the after with Wolverine dealing with the aftermath of Jean Grey's suicide on the moon. That's why it's a great story. Not just because they fight the one go, that's the trappings of it, but it's a great story because it's, uh, Wolverine and Nightcrawler cementing their friendship, which would then, you know, they had been teammates for the what previous 40 some issues. 
Um, but you know, and had moments of, you know, Hey, fuzzy elf kind of a stuff, but this was them being buddies, you know, and, and what I would consider one of the best friendships and, and definitely one of the best friendships in the X-Men period. And one of the better friendships in the Marvel universe, akin to that Simon Williams beast friendship that they had over in, in Avengers. Electra lives again, came out this month. Now this is Frank Miller and Lynn Varley's follow up to their work. They did on daredevil where they killed Electra. And he resurrects her in this. And this is a deluxe, oversized, hardcover, graph, actual graphic novel. So the next time someone says, oh, I only read graphic novels, you know, and then they proceed to talk about Watchmen and Dark Knight. You could tell them those aren't graphic novels. But have you read Electra Lives Again? Because Electra Lives Again is really great. It's really solid. And it's been, it was out of print forever. Um, I believe they recently did a reprinting of it, but it has always been really elusive to get. I don't know why that is. Maybe it's because the format, because it's it's an oversized graphic novel. Um, I, I don't really understand. Now, having said that, uh, in the shop, about over the summer, we got, and this is for you, for you, for you insider comic geeks, a standard size format reprint of Electro Lives Again came through. And myself, um, my friend, our friend Mark, uh, Alec, none of us had ever seen this before. And we think it was, if memory serves, it was like maybe from like 98, 97. Marvel reprinted Electro Lives Again as this standard size, you know, r- normal comic reprint. None of us were aware of that this that they ever did this. It was it's it was really neat. Uh, I sold it. Cause I wanted to get it out there. I didn't want to, I want to hoard that one. Cause I do have a copy of Electra lives again, but if you see, if you see it, if you ever see a standard size Electra lives again, I urge you pick it up. Cause it's just a weird publishing oddity that none of us ever think they did after this. I think the only time they've reprinted it is, has been at that larger size. So, um, there you have it. A little bit, a little bit of trivia. Um, let's see. Oh, well, Okay, so this takes the cake. So this has got to be the biggest issue of the month here. Yeah, so I'll scroll down real quick. Uh, over in What If, it's What If the Fantastic Four all had the same superpower. Over in X Factor, um, this is uh, a hint to the book we're going to talk about. Uh, Archangel is fighting Sabretooth with a Rob Liefeld cover, and that's great. Okay, so the biggest. and Oh, and Silver Surfer 35, it's more Thanos and Silver Surfer Adventures, which we talked about last month. Um that whole era starts to get is starting to climb up in value. RoboCop number one is on the stands. I'm a big proponent of the RoboCop comic book. I've got all the issues; they're pretty great. Um, and yeah, and and here we go. New Mutants number eighty-seven, the first appearance of Cable, or is it? So this is the first appearance of Cable as Cable as we know Cable, older dude, receding hairline, gray hair, too many pouches, guns that are too big. Mysterious man. Um, I don't remember if we know in this issue that he's from the future. So I, I apologize for not recalling that, but you know, from the future shows up and he knows way too much about the new mutants and he takes over leadership, etc., and so on and so forth. Uh, since cable was revealed to be Cyclops's kid, technically that retroactively makes X-Men 201 cables first appearance. And I will never not stand by that. If you're saying that it's Cyclops' son and Cyclops' son was born in an issue, you know, 201, which was, what are they on? They're in X-Men 259, so it's 48 issues. Four, so four years earlier, his kid appeared. That makes it Cable's first appearance. However, this is his first appearance as Cable. This is Nathan's first appearance as Cable. I, you know what I'm saying, obviously. they. I think they originally they were talking about making him Cannonball, but it was a mystery as who he was. Um, over in the Ultimate Universe, I think they made... Cable, yeah, they did. They made Ultimate Cable, uh, the future Wolverine, which is kind of fun. So yeah, Cable's first appearance, New Mutants eighty-seven. Second printing has a gold cover. Uh, for years, you can get that for four or five bucks. Uh, this one goes for. It's finally topped a hundred. It this book sat at eighty dollars, sixty to eighty bucks forever, like forever. And I gotta think it was Cable being in the Deadpool movie finally popped this book to to closer on the regular closer to be on over a hundred dollars. Um, this also was the bigger book before Deadpool got really popular for years. This, this book eclipsed 
Deadpool, which is coming in 98. So it was a, uh, 11 issues. Um, this, this was the hot, 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 hot book. Even after Deadpool came out, like Deadpool wasn't an overnight sensation. It, it took a few years, uh, and different writers than <laughs> the creators to make Deadpool actually popular. Uh, and that's when that new mutants 98 really popped, but 87 popped pretty quickly because people loved cable right away. Um, so there you go. So new mutants, uh, new mutants 87 and that's it. You were saying now, before we get started with GI Joe 98, let's not waste any more time and say, Hey guys, say hi online. If you're on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, go over and say hi to me at Joe and Joe pod. Send me an email to Joe and Joe pod at gmail.com or you know, if you're listening on an, on any type of, uh, iPod or, or, or like, uh, iPod, no one has iPods anymore. What am I talking about? Like any kind of podcast app, uh, jump in and give me a review. I appreciate it. Uh, you know, I appreciate it. All the reviews help. It always helps every I, I catchers pod catchers algorithms, uh, to show the show to more people and growth always helps. So with that guys, Oh, no, actually, before I forget, last week I really, real quick, I talked about, uh, talked about doing, uh, you know, that we're selling, uh, we're selling stuff on eBay. You know, I got an eBay store, right? So Joe and Joe. So go to uh, J J O J Comics and more. I know that's a mouthful, but that's the eBay store, and uh, selling a bunch of good fun stuff. A lot of uh, Star Trek stuff right now, actually, a whole lot of Star Trek stuff, but. What I forgot to say last week is you listeners, if you guys go, you guys use the code Joe on Joe 10, you get 10% off right away. Just that's it. You listeners, you're looking to buy some random old back issues. There's really no rhyme or reason. It's just fun stuff that I come across. Uh, yeah. Use J Joe on Joe 10 and save 10%. I'll tell you one thing I got. I got a, uh, shattered empire, uh, golden apple game fly variant that's on the site for 10 bucks. And it's from the, um, it's a Phil Noto cover from the star Wars shattered empire series. And it's Luke carrying Vader. It's a really, really great cover and you can get 10% off right away. Free shipping. Boom. That just happened. So GI Joe 98. Now mass is ready and ready. It is. So we got Lee weeks on this cover. Uh, it's almost, hard to tell who it is because it's an opposite autograph inside the black of the shadow of the boot of whoever this gentleman is on the cover. Uh, and there's a lot of heavy inks on this cover too, which I think makes it stand out because the, all the, all the, it's Tyrone. <laughs> is this Tyrone's first? <laughs> it's Ty It's Tyrone's first cover appearance, everybody. I don't think Tyrone has been on a cover before. Uh, <laughs> it's late on a Tuesday night and, uh, and I can't, I can't stop laughing at the idea that this is Tyrone's first and probably only cover Tyrone student of the blind master is, uh, which is on the cover of GI Joe 98 along with Raptor Mindbender, Zartan, uh, good old captain Min. Uh, and Billy, and they're standing in the shadow of someone, some be booted shadow. And it's, and, and, and this doesn't even make any Tyrone is the one who's shouting, but we thought you were dead. Tyrone, you don't know who this guy is. Tyrone never met Cobra commander. Spoiler alert. Why? Oh, oh, word balloon arrow needs to be pointing at someone else other than Tyrone. Why does Tyrone get the, what we thought you were done line. That's an all time. That's an all timer. That is an all friggin' timer. Yo, Joe! Well, he's back everybody. In case you didn't know, Stanley presents he's back. Uh, and we, we pick up the action in, in a quote remote lake in the, Abitibi territory of Northern Quebec. So this is following up on that uh, Canada storyline that we enjoyed last issue where they were, uh, the Broca arms were being smuggled in through Canada. Scenario by Larry Hama. Descines, so these are French words, by, MD, by Mark Bright. 
Ancrage by Randy Emberlin. Lettrage by Rick. I don't know if these are actual French words or just like pidgin French. Uh, Mise en couleurs. That feels real French. Bob Sharon. Editeur. Bobby Chase. And Editeur Chef. Tom DeFalco. I have a feeling these are real words. Let's see. Dessines. We're going to... Uh, we're going to Google this live, guys. Dessines is, yeah, Dessines is French for drawings. Oh, fun. That's fun. I'm, it's, I'm, figures. Encourage. Encourage. Um, yeah, hold on. Must mean inks. Yeah, ink. Ink applicator. Yeah, oh, fun. So yeah, that's fun. So there you go. There's a little French lesson for the day, guys. You can write that off in your taxes. So um, basically, after they busted up that warehouse, they've followed the the evidence to this isolated um, cabin up in up in the uh, the the Abitibi, Abitibi territory, northern Quebec. Yo, Joe. Where they were met by a, um, it's funny, it, it, the guy's in deep shadow, but it, it felt like it would have been a viper, but it's actually just a, you know, like a, a, a dude in it's flannels, uh, speaking French, uh, telling them to go, go screw off. And, um, I, what I like here is that they are in French and they've got the carrots around it, which even if you don't, and the first page is just translated from the French. And then for the rest of the story, you just have any time the carrots are on, you understand that that's coming out of it's coming. It's coming. At, uh, it's actually in French, so that's nice. Um, so this Inspector Cates, he's um, he's 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 dead set on busting uh, whoever was smuggling these uh, terror drone parts into Canada, and sure enough, inside are um, Sheik Faud Ibn Sirhan. Minister Bakana and comrade, comrade Lin Wu Zing, who um, the the uh, the ever cognizant Inspector Cates has read all of their dossiers and he knows he knows all. Remember, also the Joes here are on a uh, consultory basis. They helped shooting last time after they got permission after being fired upon, but they're still here as con- consultation. Um, so you've got all these guys from, looks like from the Middle East, from, uh, Africa, and then, um, you know, maybe China. And they're, this is what's great. They're all sitting on the couch, hanging out, but they've all gone undercover in uh, Canadian flannel. That's hilarious. Yo, Joe! Uh, and chuckles, rock and roll and clutch are with them. Chuckles has sensibly put on a winter coat. That makes sense. He's also got a um, metal detector. So they're looking for, you know, because it's like a wooden log cabin. So they're looking for like hidden electronics. And sure enough, they find one. It's got a little hydraulic system. When he flips it open off the desk, they punch a button and a, a terror drone pops out from the ice shelf. Uh, that's pretty great. So. I don't exactly understand what was happening here, but, um, like what were they like? I don't know. So were <laughs> did they, was the, ter- it's a fun gag, but was, were they, did they build a terror drone and then they were smuggling parts off of it into Canada? Is that what was happening here? Um, or were they planning a takeover of Canada? And if so, what were all these three terrorists from all over the world? What do they care about this remote part of Canada for a terror drone? I don't know, but it all happened so fast. I don't care. Yo, Joe! Uh, by the way, the three terrorists were thinking about um, attacking the Joes and, you know, escaping. When rock and roll unloads those two handheld guns again and uh, right over their head and scares them into to shutting up. So now this is where that inspector Cates, he says for the readers to, to kind of like, um, it's one of those, this is one of those things in stories where 
you have to have you have one of the characters asking the question that you think the readers are asking. I wasn't asking this question. This didn't stand out for me. So it's, I think it's important that it's here because it does set up stuff that happens certainly later in this issue. But it says, uh, guy says, I'm a bit confused. I thought that Cobra Island was now the sales center for Cobra Arms. So why send clients up to the North Country? Why ship Terradrome components all the way from the Gulf of Mexico? Um, so maybe that ties in. So maybe that's what they were doing. This was a uh, like a, a, a showroom per se. Maybe that's what it is. That this this was their showroom. So they would uh, bring the Terradrome up. They would show it off to these terrorists. They would, you know, oh, I, I like this. I want to buy one for my home country. And then they would bring it back down on the hydraulic lifts. That's probably what it was. Thank you for letting me work that out. Um, that's probably exactly what this was. So they were smuggling parts up here to further outfit the Terradrome so they could use it as a selling point, which is going to come in later as to who's doing this. Um, and Clutch says the answers are in these invoices that these Terradromes weren't shipped from Cobra Island. See, these Terradromes, he's talking about multiple Terradromes. They were shipped from Denver. Bum, bum, bum. Yo, Joe! Who do we know is in Denver? Who do we know is dead in Denver? Cobra Commander. Meanwhile, not far from Denver, there's a whole bunch of vipers digging, uh, grave digging, in the ground uh, at the behest of Mindbender and Raptor. I love the detail that Mark Bright brings to all these pages. He really paints a picture. He really sets up the, the environments that you're in and different environments um, nicely. And, you know, you know me, that's always something I think is necessary in G.I. Joe. I think G.I. Joe is so, just use the term, you know, crazy and wild and, you know, colorful costumes and, you know, weird names and weird stuff. The more you can ground it in reality in a real world, the better it works because of the craziness. If you have them in an abstract back, you know, with, with very little backgrounds or, you know, just kind of, um, um, I mean, abstract backgrounds, you know, just using colors. I think that that doesn't work as well. Cause it, it, it takes a step away from being able to believe that any of this works. Cause this is always so much on a razor's edge of, eh, it would never happen. So the more you ground them, I think they're really, really important in telling good G.I. Joe stories. Uh, and it's one of the things Larry does really well, and certain artists do it better than others, and I think Mark Bright absolutely excels at it. That's um, why he's one of my favorite all-time G.I. Joe artists. So they do dig, and where the, and this is where Cobra Commander's body was buried, and all they find is an old shirt with bullet holes in the back of it. And Raptor's as shocked as anybody. And he says, I don't understand. It has to be there. And someone off panel says, not if the body wasn't quite dead when it was buried. Yo, Joe! Cobra Commander. In the hooded flesh. Now, he looks great. He looks healthy. He's wearing a dark black version of his hooded outfit. Um... He doesn't have a direct correlation. The closest thing he is right now is the V2 hood Cobra Commander outfit, but it's not a direct correlation. The V2 didn't have like the the ribbon around the right shoulder. It didn't have, um, you know, a, a strap cutting across the chest. Uh, it's 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 like um, the V6 Cobra Commander. If you guys are looking at um, you know, yo yojo.com with me. The V6 Cobra Commander is actually closer to what we're looking at right now, except that had a silver piping, and this his piping here is still yellow. Uh, and it's also that that was a black outfit. This is really dark blue slash black. So this is pretty close to what we would get in V6, but V6 doesn't come out till 93. Now, this would have been being made in... 89 so would they have would he have known they were doing this darker version of cobra commander four years in advance probably not i mean you still had two versions of cobra commander that were due to come out before this comic book uh you had cobra commander v4 which came out in 1991 so this version was probably probably would have been production and you know it's the one right after the uh battle armor cobra commander one and that is uh I don't know what other fans call it, but this is a bow-legged monstrosity. 
um, possibly the ugliest Cobra Commander since uh, until um, Rex came along uh, for the J.J. live action movie. But this Cobra Commander with the, the red face plate is, is frightening. It is absolutely really, really frightening and looks nothing like this guy. Then you get the V5 one, which is uh, 1992, and that's the um, the speaker. It's got the little voice pack on the back. That's actually pretty close to what we're looking at here as well, uh, except the colors aren't as, aren't quite as dark. And then, of course, uh, like the V6 is pretty much the same. Is it the exact same mold? Yeah, it might actually be the exact same mold. You guys would know. Yeah, you know. I'm just I'm just comparing pictures. Yeah, V V6 is seems to be the exact same mold, just in like black and silver. So either way, this is an upgrade for the comic book version. He looks really great and he's alive and he's claiming to be the original. He's surrounded by Crimson Guardsmen, CGs. And and we learn that he he makes it his policy to have to have his CGs spy on each other. So every CG thought that he was the only one doing the spying. And Fred Seven was no exception. You know what this reminds me of? The the um, there's two things in this book that remind me of things that would happen later. This is um, reminiscent of how uh, Chris Nolan dealt with the Joker in The Dark Knight, where all the individual robbers thought they were had to kill the other guy, and they were the only one that was gonna that was gonna get killed or gonna do the killing. And it turns out they were all gonna destined to die because the Joker doesn't trust anybody. So they still need some convincing that that is actually uh, Cobra Commander. Yo, Joe! So now he's he asks all the CGs to remove their helmets, and they're all Fred clones. So they all look like the red-headed Fred. And this actually is a little bit of a problem on this page because um, artistically, the coloring takes this redhead Fredness to the extreme. Uh, and as Cobra Commander is explaining what happened, that you know Fred ate followed Fred seven and wrapped her to the burial site. And, and Cobra commander himself was near death. You know, he was unconscious in such a deep catatonic catatonic state, uh, that when Fred eight dug him up, you know, he was so close to death. So they showed him digging him up and, and Cobra commander now is drawn with reddish hair and he looks like he's digging up a Fred. So it doesn't look, and I know we never ever saw a real clear picture of Cobra commander's face, until the next panel, uh, but he's got this red Fred hair, which doesn't jive with what Cobra Commander has ever been portrayed as. And then um, in this fourth panel on the page, when all the Freds are talking to each other on the secret headline, we actually see Cobra Commander. Now, uh, that, to my understanding, is the close is the the best face on shot of Cobra Commander's face because that's Cobra Commander in the back seat of that car. That is the blue jacketed Fred who dug him up. He's got him in the he's wearing uh the Cobra Commander's in like a green grayish button up shirt. And there's a dude sitting in the back seat in a green grayish button up shirt and you clearly see his face. He frankly he looks like Flint, but that's Cobra Commander. Um do have we ever seen his face otherwise? Besides the um the mustache one? Because remember when he was in disguise when you're in disguise like that in a comic, I don't consider that seeing your face because the disguise is basically saying this is not what we could, we could draw him without the disguise and make him look wildly different tomorrow. That's kind of like the language of comics. There's no disguise on his face here, guys. I think this is the first time we've seen uh core commander's face. Then in this bottom panel, they're still giving him the Fred hair color. So now it looks like a, a, a male pattern baldness, Fred, is operating on another Fred, but that Fred is actually Cobra Commander. So this page is a little, we know what's happening, but it's not necessarily clear because of this Fred, Fred on Fredness. Yo, Joe! Uh, and real quick, let me point out, I love the way Mark Bright draws Cobra Commander's uh, full on uh, hood look. Full on hood look looks amazing. But specifically, the the kind of style that he puts on the the Cobra logo on his head, this he kind of squares it up and makes it this like blocky Cobra logo instead of the traditional rounded. Um, you know, it's got it's got round edges, but it's it's not like that circular Cobra. It's this um, just this blocky kind of a rectangular Cobra on his head, and I, I'm here for it. So now this is where it gets really crazy, and this is what I'm talking about by by hitting hitting the Nas. This 
just goes into high octane explanation. He's been gone for two years. We've been in real time. It's been two years. And apparently GI Joe takes place in real time because he talks about contracting all the CGs using seed money stashed in the Cayman islands. And he puts himself back in a business, uh, as, as Arb Arbco regional within a year, I had expanded to much larger accommodations, uh, in less than two years, I had opened offices in 10 major cities. So, guys, so much time has passed. It's been two years since Cobra Commander got killed within the pages of G.I. Joe. Now, remember when uh, we talked about Clutch and Rock and Roll getting kidnapped and brainwashed, and then when Scarlet went over with Snake Eyes and she talked about getting a, um, getting a postcard from the guys, you know, like, and because they had already gone home and gone on vacation for a low. And I was like, wow, it's really like, they really jumped ahead a couple of months or like a month or something like that, which means that Zerana and road pig were in a coma for a month. This blows all that out the water. It's been two years since Cobra commander in GI Joe time got assassinated. That's insane. And enough time for him to rebuild his criminal empire Yo, Joe! under everybody's noses. This is wild. So they're saying, you know, why didn't you come back? Uh, Mindbender is asking, why didn't you come back and reclaim, reclaim what was yours? Um, Raptor addresses that. Wait a minute. The reason you got shot in the first place is you said you were going to turn over a new leaf. And I like all this. I really, really like all this conversation because this is Hama uh, addressing the. Yeah, forget all that. We're just going to have Cobra Commander be a complete maniacal nut job again because it's more fun that way. So he says, uh, that's his whole issue, really. But he says, I can't be held accountable for a momentary lapse of judgment. You know, give up power and money. Come on, get real. So he says he's going back to Cobra Island to retake uh, retake his throne. So let's go. And with this, like, giant arm fist pump in the air, they jump in one of those Cobra uh, aspids and they go on to Cobra Island. Yo, Joe! Later on Cobra Island, we're revisiting uh, where we had left off last issue, where there were the um, there were the the dictators from all over the world there looking at arms, and they were there being shown, you know, like an arms arms um, convention, you know. So we have a couple of them out front. It's uh, Sharif. You may guys remember Sharif and General Leader Kranz. You guys remember him, uh, El Jefe, etc. So they're all back and they're, they're hanging at the Cobra arms, which is the Cobra motel. Um, by the way, the, the, the band is called deaf mangled Washington saying, why couldn't it be cold slither? That would have been dope. So they're, um, they're giving us a little bit of recap of what they're doing there and on the Island. Yo, Joe! Now this is where it gets crazy to me. Um, we jump right to the freighter where Zartan is standing alongside Cobra Commander, Billy, Crockmaster, Voltar, <laughs> Tyrone, <laughs> Min, and now Fireflies here too. Uh, remember, I think, didn't we leave them with, uh, with Crockmaster about to eat them in the sewers? So, uh, Everyone's now standing next to each other. Billy and uh, Tyrone and Min, frankly, thought Zartan was blind master. They address this here, sure, where Tyrone says, what happened to blind master? He says, he disappears and this guy Zartan shows up, what's going on? But that seems like a real afterthought. That seems like a... Now we need to get going with this storyline, which, okay, I'm cool. That's again, that's hitting the Nas on it. That's just saying, let's go, let's just get to it. We need to have a confrontation. We need, there's too many players. We need to get all these players in a room and have them all hash this out. Uh, and that's, and that's what we're getting here. So Billy's explaining that he saw Zartan fighting with the blind master back in San Francisco. And then Voltar is, is he's like, how do we know that this is really Billy? You could be an imposter. Like, what, what is going? Like, nobody knows what's going on, including, quite frankly, the reader. Yo, Joe! Because now, just straight cut to the lights are off. So 
the power has been cut to this to the freighter. And uh, in just like that scene in Raiders of Lost Ark where Belloc is at the top of the 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 well of the souls. I mean, was the well of souls? Yeah, the well of souls where the ark was. It's not where they found the map. Yeah, that was the map. Yeah, so when Belloc is on top of the well of souls, that's what you're getting here. So Zart, uh, Cobra Commander is Belloc, and he's staring down at Doctor Jones, uh, and all those guys that I was talking about in the previous page. They're all at the bottom, and it's. It's in a mad Bond villain, Cobra Commander, explaining his plot. And so far, his plot is just, I just waited until all of you got together in this freighter. And he says, of course, I'm the original, inimitable Cobra Commander. Bow down and tremble, why don't you? Um, They're calling in a question whether or not he's real or not. And he says, uh, and, and Mindbender and, and Raptor, by the way, are all on board with the new Cobra Commander. New slash old Cobra Commander. Uh, and he calls out Billy. He says, you walked out on me, precipitating my irrational decision to go straight, which resulted in my getting shot. You're disowned. You're not my son anymore. And that's what convinces Billy. Oh, yeah, that's my dad. Yo, Joe! And now he's calling out Fred Seven, who did the shooting. Uh, and this is amazing. I double-checked it. The movie Fargo came out in 1996. This comic book came out in uh, November of 1989. And Fred says, I knew I should have used the wood chipper instead. Are the Coen brothers secret G.I. Joe fans? I think they must be. I think we predicted this. Uh, Mindbender and Raptor are way too happy about this. They're just delighting in all these guys squirming. While Cobra Commander basically says, what's so funny? You two were in on it. And he throws them into the well of the cells. So this is, this is um, you know, Belloc throwing Marion down. I thought Raptor could fly. Apparently not, which is hilarious. Because uh, he just falls and hits the ground. Um, I thought Raptor could fly, though, but he doesn't. They fall. He also, Cobra Commander also throws in any Viper that is in the vicinity. They also get thrown into the uh, into the pit. Yo, Joe! Pit, I mean, the, uh, the freighter. I, for, I mean, I forgot how slam bang and, like, this is... Um, this issue is this issue is the end of Godfather Two is what is happening or Godfather One, yeah. This is this issue. No, is it two one two one? Don't ask me about my business, K. Godfather One, yeah, where he settles all the debts and he kills everybody at his uh, at his daughter's uh, christening. Yeah, this is this is the end of Godfather One. Um. Cobra Commander. No, wait. Hmm. No, that's Godfather 2. Wait a minute. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Godfather 1. Sorry. I get my Godfathers confused. Shame on me. Um. Yeah, the, you know, when when uh, when Mo Green gets shot and all the... Uh, all of the... Uh, all the enemies of the Corleone family get whacked. Uh, all the people that had did him wrong. That's what this issue is. This is Cobra Commander getting everybody all at once. So on this page, um, a really fun drawing by Mark Bright of Cobra Commander being very excited about this. I have all my worst enemies in my power. I can make them all die. Who said life is not fair? And uh, Billy is yelling at him. Uh, you kill more than just a ship full of people. You, you know, If you kill us, you kill your own humanity. And he's not wrong. And he says, that was killed long ago when my own son tried to kill me. And he's referencing, like, what was it? G.I. Joe, was it 18, 19? When um, we didn't even know Billy was his son and the little kid pulls the gun on him? Or is that in uh, the 20s? But either way, he slams the lid shut. Yo, Joe! And then proceeds to set off a bunch of charges on the island. Now remember, Cobra, Cobra Island is a very volatile structure. Uh, I was going to say newly built, but if Cobra Commander has been dead for two years, there's a good chance Cobra Island has been around for 15 years. Just throwing that out there. Um, so these preset de uh, charges have been detonated. And remember, Cobra Commander talked about having all these CGs working for him. So these CGs were setting this up the whole time. Now, I, you know, I, all right, I'm, I'm here for it. That's what all this planning is. It's he's Machiavellian. That's what this is. You know, he was going to plan to have them lured into the freighter, I guess it works. 
So uh, the coup is happening. All these generals realize that, that, that they smell a coup in the air. Yo, Joe! And what's happened is all those charges have opened up a river. So ocean water is now flooding into the island. And it's picking up the boat, uh, the um, abandoned freighter. And it is, um, it's, it's <clears throat> rolling it into rowing, rowing, flooding, carrying it, transporting it. That'd be the right word. Transporting it into the dormant volcano. Now everyone inside is in complete jet black darkness, which is great. Um, they don't really, they don't, they draw it like that. You know, everyone's in shadow. They remind us that, yeah, there's no way these guys, these guys can't see anything. They haven't struck matches or anything yet. So they're in complete darkness. And all of a sudden this boat's moving. This boat hasn't moved in, you know, like I said, 15 years or, you know, three years, whatever. Time flies apparently in G.I. <laughs> Joe world. Yo, Joe! And Cobra Commander hits one final explosion, explosion, pardon me. And, um, that's the wall to the volcano. So instead of crashing into the volcano, they're actually going to go into the volcano. Um, so now we get a little day for night going on where Zartan's yelling at everybody. Uh, we can't afford to panic. We've got to keep our wits, blah, blah, blah. Someone, someone who rightfully, it's pretty funny. Someone says, why don't you change yourself into a key shapeshifter? Then we can unlock that hatch and get out of here. That's pretty fun. Uh, and that's not Billy. That's Tyrone chesting up to Zartan saying, that's what happened. You killed the blind master and changed your form to take his place. Is everybody on this island a murderer and an imposter? And Zartan starts to explain when uh, it's too late. Yo, Joe! Because the freighter is going into, like over a waterfall kind of, into the uh, volcano. Uh, and everyone, this is, those people are really screwed. <laughs> they're, they're really screwed. As we get uh, some of the onlookers saying there were people inside that ship and Cobra Commander is now standing in front of everyone, all these onlookers on Cobra Island. Remember, it's a full Cobra Island because they're there for the arms convention. And this is Cobra Commander's triumphant return. This is all these traitors, backstabbers, sycophants, and other egregious individuals who had the utter gall to do me dirt. Let them cease to exist. And he pushes one final button. Yo, Joe! And whammo. The whole top of the volcano blows up and crushes the guys in the freighter, including his son. And he says, uh, oh, so much for burying old differences. Now let's adjourn to the bargaining tables and let's talk business. Yo, Joe! That's exciting. That's, uh, that's exciting. So we have a couple more pages here, a uh, little epilogue where uh, at a federal courthouse in New York, we see that Zorana and the Dreadnoughts, um, they're, they're being let loose by the government because, um, let's see here, according to their lawyer, the indictment was overturned because of insufficient cause, illegal wiretapping, improper procedure, etc., etc., ad infinitum. We have a criminal justice system in this country. Gentlemen, learn to play by its rules. Uh, and... You know, um, Zorana says, you know, she knows what they did to Clutch and Rock and Roll. And they're flying back in from Canada in order to testify. By the way, they're landing a tomahawk on the steps, right in front of the steps of the federal courthouse building, which is great. She says, don't look so disappointed. You know what they say in Rome, veni vidi broca. And so when she says broca, they get all loopy and kooky. Yo, Joe! And the, the Cobras are leaving. They're making their legal escape. Uh, and she says one more time, boy, will I be ever get be glad to get back to Broca Beach to try to, you know, um, screw with their heads a little bit. Also, she's running the Broca Beach operation. And that's when a CG slams the door in her face and they all get guns pulled on them because uh, they're, quote, all getting extradited to Cobra Island to stand trial for treason. But don't worry, the trial won't take too long since you've already been found guilty. Yo, Joe! And at the Pentagon, we get uh, General Hawk and General Hollingsworth. They've been called in front of the jugglers. 
And the jugglers, who was the top secret, um, like like heads of the government that control all the money and kind of control the, you know, they pull the purse strings behind the scenes. We're unhappy, gentlemen. The press is tearing us to shreds over this last debacle at Cobra Consulate. Remember, this is the Snake Eye stuff, so the building's smoldering on the, on the cover of the Washington Post. And, they're, and that Cobra is now a legitimate business. And they say, we don't see any reason for not retiring this unit's colors, talking about G.I. Joe, and reassigning all personnel to other standing units. Wow. Next issue is going to be is, is the calm before the storm. We've got some letters over in Postbox the Pit from uh, Kevin Todaro out of Kirkland, Washington. Got a John Ra- Ra- Rafok? 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 No address on the letter, so John Raffock, whatever your name is, get an address. He was unhappy with ninjas. Tracy Ingalis, out of Door, Michigan. Welcome aboard, Tracy. Quentin Bedwell. Now, Quentin, he wants a career working in comics. Now, he was uh, he was five in 1982. So this would have been, so he'd been 12 years old at this point. Because of that first issue of G.I. Joe, he wants a career working in comics. And one more thing, I hope your comic book company is in business long enough that Quentin Bedwell can join it. Because he's your biggest fan. Now, there's no address here, so you don't know where Quentin Bedwell came from, nor what happened to him. But, uh, oh, speaking of that, and one more letter from Patrick Whitehill out of Georgetown, Pennsylvania. Not only have I not, uh, I haven't heard back from that letter I sent to, um... Deuce or Duce, if you're out there listening, Duce. Um, but I also haven't had it returned either yet. So, and that's been a couple weeks. The, the other letter came was returned pretty quickly back back to us. So, hopefully, either Duce got it, and maybe you're out there listening, or maybe it went to a uh, a new tenant of the home, and maybe you're out there listening. You know, but either way. So far, so good. We haven't had a negative response on the Duce letter for you longtime Joe and Joe listeners. So that's it. And that's what I'm talking about with G.I. Joe 98, where it is uh, someone reminded them that they have a issue 100 to get ready for. And they cleaned house. They went Godfather 1 on it. They they just, they shot Mo Green. They, they trapped, they blew up everyone in the freighter. Uh, all these dudes are off the, I mean, they killed Tyrone. Tyrone. Bly, I mean, Billy. Now, uh, I don't remember who survived, but I do remember that some people did actually die in this freighter thing. Um, so don't spoil it for me because we're going to find out as the comics go along. But, um, you know, Cobra Commander is just wiping stuff off the board. So now, you know, the, the big thing is he has to have his reckoning with Destro because Destro were like, um, oh, no, Destro quit. Destro quit last issue. That's right. So he's off the board. So this is the best time. This is the best time for him to take over. Okay, so Cobra Commander's back, guys. Everyone, you know, G.I. Joe's, I mean, woo, I liked it. I enjoyed I enjoyed it. I, I, I like this high octane. Let's make a lot of changes. Although, I'll say this, a little bit of a demerit. It's a really quick wrap up on that whole uh, Zartan being a uh, blind master in order to reform himself. That was a pretty disappointing end to that storyline. They may revisit it. Obviously, Zartan has remained a bad guy over the years, you know, through the Devil's Due stuff and certainly, you know, in the modern the modern stuff, too. So uh, I get it. You, you only have so many bad guys. You can't reform them all. But I guess I was hoping for more from that. Like, it seems like a wasted opportunity. But, you know, that's comics. They get ideas, they start them, and then they go, wait a minute, what if we did this? And then they do that. And, um, you know, we know we see more from Zartan, so we know he makes it out of there. But maybe ooh, maybe he, maybe he, when he leaves, he's pretending to be somebody else, and then we think that person. Maybe, please, Zartan, pretend to be Tyrone. Please pretend to be Tyrone. And we'd be like, oh, my God, Tyrone lived, and then it's really Zartan. That would be amazing. So I can't wait to find out. I, I don't remember how long it is until we find out who lived through that. But uh, we will see in a future episode of Joe on Joe Illustrated. So thank you, listeners. I appreciate each and every one of you. Now you, Joe, and Joeing is half the battle.